history, heritage, photography, and politics, with a career in architecture and activism, you get Muna al Halla. Muna is a storyteller in her own right. And if you ever get the chance to go to Beit Beirut on the Green Line, also known as Al Barakat Building, if you're lucky, you'll see her there, sharing the building's history and a part of our history we're too eager to get rid of. Now, this episode takes place in Muna's office on Bliss Street in Ras Beirut, facing AUB's campus. And the backdrop is perfect for the story because half of the view is AUB and what Beirut looked like 100 years ago or so. And you can see the sea. You have access to the Mediterranean. The other half of the view are towers blocking the coast. Towers built in the last two, three decades after the Civil War, some of them only in recent years. And this is the terrain we cover today. The post-Civil War urban chaos and urban decay that really destroyed a lot of the beautiful architecture that once made Beirut famous. From the fate of Martyrs Square to the old souks of Beirut, from Solidaire to the municipality and beyond. We're with Mona al for the third episode of the Beirut Banyan. Beirut is the only city probably where uh, there's no urban planning in a city that, that produces so many good urban planners in its universities. One of them is AB. So we, we have urban planners, but we do not have urban planning because there's no government, there are no laws. The, the, when there are laws, they're not applicable. When they're applied, they are applied exce- with exceptions that actually work against the, the city. So And where corruption is uh, intertwined with development and... Um, it's the only place where the city has blocked itself from its sea. We are a city along the Mediterranean that cannot see the Mediterranean except if you're in a tower. In a tower. You know, I think there's a, there's a theme I've picked up after getting to know you in the last few years and also watching your interviews and, and maybe appreciating the immediate post-war era that I was too young to really embrace is that there's been a dismantling of anything public in the city and a very uh, inward looking into the private individual sort of landscape. And this can be even drawn, I think, to your own experience because it shouldn't be up to one architect to do all this work or it shouldn't even be a dozen architects. It should be something that's very neutral and very boring. It should be an office in the municipality making sure all this stuff works properly. And I always get the feeling that that was the case before. And the further back you go, the more of that existed. And I'd like to maybe gauge your mind on this, because you are a, you're a one-woman show. I am. <laughs> and, and, and I'm a veteran. And you're a veteran. And, <laughs> and, but I haven't lived the pre-war era. Sure. Where I heard or I read yeah. about, you know... Um, the urban planning, mm-hmm, when mm-hmm. Fa- Mr. Fawaz was on board, when people who really cared about the public interest were heading the, the public When you say Mr. Agencies. Fawaz, you're referring Muhammad to the Fawaz, Fawaz. Fawaz. Yeah. So that's going back sort pre- of pre, pre-war. Pre-war and, yeah. and yeah. So w- when, the, when the master plans of Beirut mm-hmm, were done, mm-hmm. w- they were done with, with, some, with interest. To the, when, when the Corniche was a non when anything below the Corniche was non edificante yeah? Now that goes a bit more, uh, sure. more back to yeah. 1954. But the first urban planning of Beirut was, was, you know, proper urban planning. When they put the first urban plan, the first the master, master plan, uh, everything below the Corniche was non edificante so no building whatsoever, no exceptions, so that people promenade on a corniche in a city on the sea and what and look at the sea and since 90 since the 60s early 60s the developers starting to take over so it's not a war it's not a war issue it started before the war and it's the war just uh 
um, conti- yeah, as, uh, throughout the war, the you know the anarchy and just the mess that the war produced, and the post-war was just the total you know failure of everything. But there's a link that I share with you, and I think we both captured it. You're just a little older, though you look much younger. But you're. Uh, <laughs> I you're, wish. <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> for me, it's true. <laughs> but uh, you often refer to the last days of pre-war Beirut that survived 15 years of fighting. And that's most eloquently described in Martyr's Square. I think it's probably your favorite part of the city, even though it doesn't exist anymore. And it's my favorite part of the city for, mi- for many reasons. But I think I, as a, I was 12, 13, before the bulldozers came and wiped it off the map. And even then, war-torn, green line, and a lot of it was probably beyond repair. It would have costed a lot of money, but it was worth saving. Um, it just disappeared. And I think that's almost a turning point in how residents of Beirut interact with the city, it's too. It's definitely a turning point in my life. Yeah. That day in 1994, when I came back from my master's in Italy, that was the only year I ever left Beirut. So you left in 1990? 1993. 1993. I just left for one year for my master's. So you left just before Solidaire's bulldozers entered Martyr Square. Yeah, but after we definitely lost the... We as activists mm-hmm. who started... Okay, so I, I graduated in 1990 from the American University of Beirut. So that was the end of the war and my graduation. Right. So as an architect, of course, all you dream about is you go out and build. Can you take me back rebuild. a bit to those years, the late 1980s? The Civil War is winding down, even though it's still a brutal... Not really. 1989 was, sure. the, for us, one of the worst years. Absolutely. And 1989, because it was our our graduation project, final year project, we decided to stay on campus. Okay. So we slept on campus for six months we we couldn't go back home it was very hard to to uh, navigate the city can you tell me about those trips where were you living at the time at the I as a as a as uh, a student as and a, my my parents' house yeah. was on the on the green line. W- where uh, was it? Was it? Basta. it was Basta. It was Burj Al Haida. Okay, so, so from it was really bad, mm. and it was impossible for me to go and back back on to the university every day. In in those years, did you ever stumble into downtown? I never went into downtown. Downtown no. was it was only in in memories yeah. by my parents, in photographs mm-hmm. that I've seen, in projects that we've done. In the in, in the architecture so school. So even when there were temporary lulls in fighting, I never there went was never. Down. So you would go from Busta West and then exactly. north to Hamra. For me, okay. it was the Green Line, and it was yeah. we, my my parents were very conservative and not very uh, courageous. And at, I would say I wasn't. Also, I, I my character has changed dr- dramatically. I was a nerd. I had gone through projects about downtown. A workshop with Robert Saliba on how to, uh, on the reconstruction of downtown because everybody expected that at some time the war would end and we'd have to reconstruct about the memories of downtown, about the collective memory, the urban uh, identity, etc. So the first thing that happened. When, nine, when they stopped the fighting is we going down yeah. to, to look at what we always had in news on the television and in, in memories of our parents. Where is Automatique? Where is Daraj Khan al Where is the Su'at I mean, even though this is probably still fresh in your memory, that Basta to Martyr Square is a very short distance, literally down the street. Exactly. I mean, it is walking distance. Exactly. So, and, yeah. and you know, for an architect, mm-hmm. the architecture of downtown, because it's the oldest part of the city, right? So for an architect, also the discovery of seeing that architecture that is completely uh, ruined by mm-hmm. the war, scarred, but at the same time, it's there. Yeah. So for me, even Martyr Square in its destruction, it was Martyr Square. Yeah. But it was destroyed, but it was a square. The souks were destroyed destroyed but they were the souks you could feel the scale you could feel the architecture you can you could feel the even the human you know so relationship in to architecture you walked into the souks yes and we, and you saw and we collected you know mm, we collected mm. things i still have i still have the metal boxes from behind rivoli oh, because wow. the, the the film boxes yeah. because they were like there you could i mean at that time it was we were afraid of mines and stuff mm, but mm. at the same time we were courageous enough to pick up because with other people so I still have two boxes from the Rivoli, which was Tarazan has a son. It was the film, yeah? So those I picked from Rivoli, yeah. from, the, from the in front of the Rivoli cinema. So this is... That was before the demolition, right? right. Before, before Solidaire existed. So those three years before 1993, 
those so almost like a uh, it's it's almost like a uh, frozen in time. Right. That the Civil War ended, but the Civil War scars were still visible. Exactly. And then out of nowhere, so they there disappear. Comes up and they just erase everything. I yeah. can never forget that day. Mm. And you're you're a, you're you've graduated by then. So you're you're a I mean I was a practicing architect. practicing architect. With the when the Solidarity project was announced and the, uh, we saw the plans of everybody at least we, everybody on our on, with our uh, mindset yeah. was really disturbed and really shocked and really against the project. And now we call it the herbicide because it was really the death of a city because it didn't acknowledge neither the collective memory of the city nor the social fabric of the city. It addressed the physical, developmental, real estate value of the land. And you felt that even before the bulldozers came in, that there was going to be, this was going to happen. The plans were very clear. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you remember the first project with with Solidaire had an access on Machi Square that ended in a in a in a in an island that was a yes. compound yes. island for the rich, right? With, I, that, with yeah. a bridge connecting it to the. That's, to the, a, and a, that's an old plan, that right? That was that's the from first, 19, one, then, one of the first yeah, proposals. Yeah, yeah, right, and right. I was right. like, what do what do you mean? <laughs> uh, you want to be, even make it more exclusive than one what what it what what it's. But you yourself, as someone, as an architect, practicing architect, an individual citizen, seeing this happen, did you feel the frustration then that this is beyond your control? Or did you sense that, no, we can actually maybe influence this or no, turn it around? No. We, we felt that, that it was too powerful because, yeah. because when, you know, at that time I was a two-year-old architect yeah. in the, in the, and I'm talking to, I'm, I'm trying to lobby with people who have been, you know, Asim Salam was my teacher, mm-hmm, Jacques mm-hmm. Tabit was my teacher. So if if, though, if they cannot do anything, they cannot force their, you know, even to reconsider the main elements, to reconsider the preservation of Martyr Square as a square, you cannot open Martyr Square to the sea. It doesn't become a square anymore. So it loses the morphology, the urban morphology. It loses... Forget about the memory. Even the morphology has changed. This is something I really want to dive deep into because it's, a, it's something that... I was a teenager. You're a, you're an architect, uh, so you you were you're seeing something with some perspective because you're in your teen years. You were able to walk around downtown and see what was left and appreciate it. You're collecting things. You're treasuring things, and then it vanishes. D- did you think that there was a permanent scar done not just to Martyr Square but to how Lebanese interact? with Beirut today. There was no downtown anymore. No downtown. It would never become downtown again. I'm curious, though, before Solidaire, so going back to Civil War, and then 1991, 90, early 92, uh, was downtown appreciated, or is this something that happens after Solidaire starts? I think... Because be- it's 15 yeah. years of no access, and you're yeah. Because you can't you can't say it was appreciated except by architects who had a vision yes. to see beyond the destruction, right. to see beyond the garbage, but to going, see beyond the trickling water, beyond the stray your, dogs. But let's say going back to your parents' generation, my parents' generation, or our grandparents' generation. Do you feel like they had fond nostalgia of Martyrs Square for what it was, or is that something that developed after the war ended and then it after it vanished? Because I always, I'm I'm curious about the centrality of Martyr Square to the no, average Lebanese it's inhabitant. It's definitely for the for our parents and mm. our grandparents. This was very central, and this shows from all the mental maps we've asked them to play. Every time we ask somebody to draw a mental map of downtown Beirut, yeah. Martyr Square is the star Absolutely. and the souks. But is that something that we lost even before the war broke out? And what I'm asking about is, I look at Martyr Square from the early 1970s, those last years, when it's still the central hub, it's still the, it's still the focal point of the city, but it looks like it's been neglected. Mm-hmm. And it looks almost like Martyrs Square is now no longer the beating part of the city. Mm-hmm. And I almost get the feeling that Hamra was becoming what Martyrs Square used to be in the yeah. 50s and 60s, that the the traditional role of Martyr Square had shifted west. The commercial hub definitely shifted west. And with the cinemas, you know, with the cinemas... Yes, and the cinemas was, were lining up Hamra exactly. as well. And even the cafes, they were kind of moving west. Did Martyr Square, did it, was it handicapped already? I mean, of course, Civil War made it something else. Definitely. But in 19, early 1975... 
did it still have that role that we think of when we refer to those years? Definitely not as far as the the commercial cultural activities mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. definitely Hamra was taking over yeah. because of the novelty novelty yeah. of the cinemas novelty of the there were the first com- the first you know commercial kind of uh, malls you yes. know they were in Hamra yeah. the, those that when you can't you can't compare cinema Roxy to cinema El Dorado right sure, sure. and and the Hamra street and the cafe trottoirs but but I think nothing would ever would ever take the the memory of the place, right? They mm-hmm. still wanted to go and have that jilleb at Antabli. Yes. Or after mm-hmm. having the cinema, watching a film in Hamra. Uh-huh. So there was that. But yeah. but yes, you are very, very, it's very true that it has, the, that role was shifting. Was so it was shifting. naturally leaving Martyr's Square already. I'm, I, I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. And this is all hypothetical, but assuming there was no civil war. Would it anyway have died? Exactly. Yeah. Um, it is the geographic yeah. heart. It is the old city center, and it did serve a role at some point. But assuming there was no physical division within Beirut, it's very interesting to think about it this way. I never thought about it this way, but I would I would say uh, the words, energy uh, would have been there. There must have been a dynamic that would bring because the centrality of that place, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't think would let it die. Yeah, I think something would have been done to bring back to bring back not the you know the modernism the novelty right. to it to make it ultimately a cinema there would have done something to be beating the cinemas in Hamra mm. I think some because the centrality of the of the place in the in the countries in the country's collective identity I think would would bring people back to it and I, I think always of the Rivoli you said something very sweet about the Rivoli that you're finding the old film and you're preserving it the Rivoli is one of the most ugly buildings you can find definitely and but it's a backdrop of the most important piazza right and it's also in place of what was a very stunningly beautiful Turkish palace so that almost yeah I mean I um, now I wouldn't say ugly because I'm an architect who's fond of modern <laughs> okay, architecture sorry, I'm, I'm so I would say right. like a very you can you can say that it wouldn't like appeal to the public to the public taste, right? Yeah. But it is a modern building that has a, that has a modern language that mm-hmm. we architects appreciate. Okay. Yeah. But for me, what I appreciate about it is the backdrop. You know, being yeah. being the backdrop of of it's the backdrop of Martyr Square. Mm-hmm. So there's this facade, this stern facade that yes. always has a cinema, you know, advertisement. You know, I I always so, get the feeling that our chief complaint, whether it's a, uh, an architect with a profession in this and a passion for it, or the simple person walking across Martyr Square, is not maybe its rule, but that it's desolate. Yeah. I think that is the, it's a cosmetic... It's a parking lot. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, it's very hard to find disagreement on that because there's no, there's no justification. You can't just leave it as a parking lot. But I think that is the biggest frustration with Martyr Square is that it's, it's been left like that. For me, what's what I couldn't never understand and still do not understand is even if Solidaire had a commercial, you know, the, the, the logic of Solidaire was never to rebuild the city, was to make money out of the of the burnt city. In in all good intentions maybe, but it wasn't. It wasn't uh, the to rebuild the memory of the city or the, the identity of the city. But still, why hasn't if the dividing line, the green line started at Martyr Square, if Martyr Square is really the place where people were the division started and it's so marked, why why hasn't it been given the first attention to become a reconciliation place? Yeah. I would say I just dreamt of Marty Square just lined with trees and benches, nothing more, nothing less, and some lights. I'm not saying a big intervention, Absolutely. something that would just let people come here and use the space, just use the space. Absolutely. Why should it be a parking lot for 25 years? Absolutely. Why not put put the people together, do not put the, make them come together, just give them the tools, just benches and trees that to, and, and let the place work as a, as a unifying place. I and it would have done Absolutely. That. And I'm going to get to, actually, I want to tackle that subject in depth. But just before, I love looking at the same angle of Martyrs Square over the years, from the eight, 1890s, mm-hmm. 1920s, and suddenly it's become the 1960s, what, what it used to be, that sort of very, very important part. And then 
early 1970s parking lot is there. Mm-hmm. It's a bus the terminal. Bus and, and service. Service. Issue. The yeah. trams are dismantled, and suddenly you have pollution, you have traffic, and you have sort of a run-down Martyrs Square. And then suddenly, 1990s, you have nothing there. And today, almost 30 years after the Civil War ended, and people park their cars. It's almost like parking is the consistency of Martyrs Square, which is the biggest tragedy. But the parking in the before the war was parking that brought people that brought people brought people in and out of the city. So well said. It well has said. it has different roles. And totally. that goes back to the public and private. Exactly. Because that even yes, it's it's a public, public transportation. Public transportation. Which, which is our basic concern today in the city Absolutely. that lacks public transportation. And Martyrs Square should not be luxury condominiums or empty business it, it, it is not meant even even if that's the most well-intentioned investment idea it doesn't work it ruins the heart of the city it's, how can yeah. it be the heart of a city it's not it's the heart of their city it's yeah. the heart of an exclusive city it's sure. it's a it's a city it's a heart that is that whose heartbeats are controlled by security guards now to get into a trickier issue Civil war ends, and there's no solidaire. Yeah. And the municipality is running the show. We're now in an era where Beirut has no investment uh, uh, along the lines of multi-billion dollar share. Uh, there's no shares, none of that. The Beledi, the municipality, is running the show. Do you think Martyr's Square would have ended up better than it is today? It's a very, very tricky and and complex issue because definitely solidaire was one way of of practically rebuilding a destroyed and contested uh, city right but the way it was done was was what what we were against so it's almost like the the opportunity to have done it in the right way. Influence Solidaire differently was not... Exactly. Why wasn't the social layer taken into consideration? Why should we kick everybody out and then selectively bring people in because they are rich, because they can afford it? Why... Why... Not too many people wanted to claim back their... 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 uh, their... Uh, properties, property. right? Yeah. Yeah. Why why didn't we give those few people the chance to come back, right? I'm not saying make it easier, but why didn't we make it easier for people to claim their reclaim their property? They put the hardest conditions on people in two years after to have the highest specifications for rebuilding. Nobody would have ever been able to do that. They knew that they are excluding people from doing that. But just yeah. for plain devil's advocate yeah. here, al yeah. locked for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Corniche is... N- I mean, we can see parts of it from here. Yeah. The Corniche is... It's, a, it's tragic. I mean, part this, this reclamation, destroying yeah. rocks, millions of years old. Uh, what they want to do now. Oh, it, yeah. and even what they want to do now, which yeah. you're... Yeah. I mean, you're rightfully opposed to, and I hope they it doesn't do. happen. Hopefully destroying the Corniche and making it into something very different or even uh, these I mean it's something simple the sewage and it's, it's no longer that, that is not solely there right that is yeah. that's the other that's the city that's the city so we don't know if if we don't know if the municipality would have done better mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and maybe not yeah yeah but without this powerful you know project that came with the power to expropriate from to take everybody out and have this you know monolithic uh, decision of how to rebuild downtown it's definitely it's bound to be not democratic right yeah i mean this is what this is what you get and yeah. this is how what you what we are offering take it or leave it right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, and all you get is your shares and get out of my way let me do my thing right i'm gonna give you just i'm gonna tell you one little story for which for me describes solidaire in a very simple way mm-hmm. Al Antabli is the most important, uh, you know, uh, juice shop in Lebanon, right? And, and downtown, everybody wanted to go e- drink either lemonade or gelé from Antabli. So, and it was in in the souks 
with uh, with a piazza that is called Sahat al Antabli with a fountain in the middle that's called Nafurt al Antabli, the fountain of Antabli. Right? And these are beautiful and photos that are always. I mean, it's they are, it's, it's like a landmark yeah, thing in, yeah. in downtown, right? Mm-hmm. So they, the souks of Beirut, unfortunately, were given uh, to, um, to, an, uh, to a brilliant architect who ended up doing a mall. Uh, instead yeah. of the souks, but he in t- insisted on preserving the names and the memory of some of the issues. And one of them was Sahat al Antabli and the Nefura and the, and the fountain. And he recreated the fountain and the, uh, the same morphology of the street, right. which was Tawile, and it was right there, right? So finished, done, beautiful. For us, it's just another shopping mall, but that, that area had some character, right? A forced character, but it was there. So al Antabli, the guy, goes to rent those shops that are around his. Then and, and the plaque, the sign says the Antabli yeah, sure. thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So he goes to rent them out. The prices are prohibitively expensive. Yeah. So he's just a simple juice seller who has suffered war and post-war, and he didn't have, definitely couldn't afford it. If I were Solidaire, I would have given him a much reduced price just to bring Antabli back to his place. <laughs> yeah, just to make sure, you know, some authenticity is, is in this place. He couldn't, what he did is, and they wouldn't give him any facility, facilities. So what he did is look for the smallest shop he could afford, and it was a three by four shop, right? Six or seven shops down the lane. Yeah. And he rented it for years. Yeah. And who rented his place previously? Cafe Balima. And they were serving French food on the Antabli fountain, right? right? Yeah. Until the crisis hit and Balima closed yeah. and they put it up for rent all the area and for a year and a half, nobody rented it. Mm-hmm. And then they came to Antabli and said, would you like to come and rent for very cheap rent? Why didn't we do this in the beginning? And then Antabli would have made money and would have been able to yeah. afford the higher rent. But there wasn't this little consideration of what could bring people back to this place as people, yeah. not as you know, physical buildings and... You know, I'm, I'm, I always try to put Beirut in perspective because, I mean, there are other cities that experience division, yeah. war, yeah. Uh, all types of investments and reconstruction. I mean, Berlin is a great example because it ended around the same time. You had, so similar to a green line, you have a division, you have a wall. In the early 1990s, Berlin changes and it becomes something else. And the contested parts of Berlin are still somewhat contested, but most people seem to sort of agree that that's how it's going to be, and that's the new Berlin, and we move forward. Here, I don't know if that's the case. And I I know that the, the more passionate urban planner or the architect who knows better is hurt from what happened here. But I, I don't know if average Beiruti resident cares that much, whether or not the suit was rebuilt as it was, whether Ayn Tebli was yeah, there. But it's not about nostalgia. You know, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not yeah. about nostalgia. But that comes now back to something more basic, which is public governance. Exactly. I mean, and that's the big tragedy here, that we have poor governance. And, I mean, not just, of course, not just urban planning. I wish it's only poor. It's corrupt governance. And that makes, yes. that's the problem. Is that's that the problem. There's no public interest in the mind of any of the public public agencies. Right, yeah. And maybe this is a good segue into get into leaving Martyrs Square, leaving downtown, and maybe going a little south on the Green Line into your, I'd like to say your biggest accomplishment, although you probably have more accomplishments to come. And It is. But it is, I mean, it is a big accomplishment for you, for me, for lots of people that love this city. You made magic happen. <laughs> The magic here is saving the Barakat building, or known as Beit Beirut today. This is the only location in the city where the civil war is reflected. And the building today serves as a museum meant to remind us of the cost of violence that tore the city apart and the toll it took on Beirut and the city's residents. And if you ever see Mona there, it's a treat. She brings every corner, every wall, every bullet hole, every sniper's den to life. 
there was an army, an army position right outside. So I went out and I said, do you think it's safe to enter this building? He said, particularly, I think yes, but you know, you have to watch out for mines. So I said, do you think there would be mines? He said, if you step on something and makes a sound, don't move your feet and shout. And I'm like, you're, you're kidding, right? He said, no, but I mean, you should just look around, but we don't think this is a mine building. Otherwise it wouldn't have been left open. Yeah, yeah. So I entered the ground floor and I just saw on the ground floor the the, the void uh, from from inside and then on the ground floor I saw the first bunker which is on the ground floor and I didn't have the courage to go up so this is now 1993 1994 94. September 1994 September 1994 da- Martyr Square is gone downtown's being redeveloped or being Windows. changed completely totally and you are in what's left to a certain degree of the green line, not bulldozed, but sort of still in limbo. Exactly. And you're seeing, you're seeing I'm a seeing, civil war. I'm, yeah, but I'm seeing an, an avant-garde building. Uh, yeah, so you're actually That has seeing, many, many, many layers of importance other than being a war-torn building. It's amazing that that snapshot, I'm trying to see you as a student or a graduate student with a, now a master's degree from Florence and you're back and you're almost summing up a hundred years in one moment because this is turn of the century this is a uh, golden era architecture this is civil war m- most destructive violent part of our history and this is post-war frozen in limbo in limbo and you're there and i think i, I hope i'm i'm saying this right this is your shift from just from not just architecture but this to is activism. my shift to activism yeah this day was my activism because when i entered to that ground floor um, a bunker mm-hmm. and I looked through I, it was my, the, of course in downtown we saw lots of those but that was like kind of a genius you, you, I would I would dare say I was uh, I was in, impressed by the work that was done by the archi- by the architectures of the architecture of the war I was really impressed by the way they integrated their structures into the and they abused the transparency of the building it was almost I was admiring something that killed people yes so on my yeah. architectural level my mind was boggled like they really did really abused this building in such a brilliant way at the same time this is the place where people killed each other and this made it a better killing machine right. the, uh, the genius of the architect could actually be destructive <laughs> right and and then i i was working with this with this firm with george reyes reyes and jamal firm and we i took my friends to see to see the building and because it's really something to learn from in those years the army was sort of just turning a blind eye to you you'd go in they yeah. kind of got to know you it's an and empty building empty it's building right you can, you, so, they so don't care there's no even yeah there's no no, no nothing and, no no yeah, not yeah, at yeah. all and mm-hmm. then i started getting people and friends and going enjoying that enjoying the place yeah. and then when we 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 went up as a group I, I discovered the treasure of Najib Shimali, that apartment that still has the life of this guy who lived since 1943 in the building, yes. and he collected newspapers and visiting cards and bottles and everything. His life was there. Was it there that you saw the uh, the French embassy award? The uh, the you were you were given a prestigious award in 2015. Yeah, the, I, I, the French pronunciation it's is the terrible. The Ordre National du Mérite au Grade de Chevalier. Thank you. <laughs> I, would have, I would have destroyed that. Wasn't this man given the same award? Exactly. Yeah. And you know what? When 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 I was told by the head of the Institut Français that I took this award, it was by mail, and he told me I don't have the official letter for you yet. But he loved he loved the fact that that they did. did they did appreciate me because he he really wanted this building to become the museum we were talking about and he took me to his office and he showed me the mail and it said another uh, of another there are many state uh, stages uh, yeah. levels of this award mm-hmm. so the, it was the higher level which is which is called legion d'honneur and he told me but i'm very i'm very i'm it's very difficult it's very weird because this is only for french people but they gave it to you so it's like it's the oh. highest award and I'm like... Oh, I'm so back then it was just French citizens, and yeah, now yeah. it's all... No, okay. no, 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 it no. was. The Légion d'honneur is only for French citizens. Only for French, okay. So he told, but I told him, I wish it was the Ordre National du Mérite, and he said, why? I told him, because the, Dr. Schmali had the Ordre National du Mérite yeah. from the French people. And the second day he calls me and said, guess what? It's a mistake in the in the email. They had typed it wrong. You got the Ordre National du Mérite. Oh, wow. And I'm sorry, it's the lower one. I told him, don't be sorry. <laughs> I'm so happy that me and Schmali got exactly the same award. That's, that's quite nice. So, so that's... 
this the... man lived with me, you know. I think he made he made this building alive for me. Yeah. Because I would go take people. They would go on to photograph and roam around, and I would go with my surgical gloves and a bag yeah. and just go through the papers because I'm a collector and I'm fascinated with old archives. Were you conscious of what you were doing back then? Definitely. So you were well aware that this is your moment. I was collecting because I couldn't believe that the first time, the first time I entered, I picked up a card that said it had it was Kamal Zumblat's visiting card, oh, wow. and it said <laughs> we congratulate I congratulate you for the new year. It was the fountain pen of Kamal Zumblat wow. on his card. That day, I decided I'm gonna go through these papers one by one. And yeah. I started collecting and collecting and collecting for 18 years. But was this for you a, 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 a injustice towards injustice that you saw the downtown? You saw something? I, had, I saw a chance to, to collect memory that was erased just before my just, eyes. Yes, right. And I, I saw a chance to keep a building that other buildings that were maybe more important than this one were just bulldozed. Yeah. So for me, it was really, it was my personal, it was a very personal thing. At the yeah. beginning, it was mm. because I was working with Absad on preservation of heritage buildings, not only this one. Yes. But this one became my personal, you know, fight. Yeah. Because I would say to the Absad people, if we cannot save the Barakat building, which has avant-garde architecture, the architect is the architect of the municipality of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. The, the building has a strategic position on a corner that is very well, very well yeah. exposed. It has the traces of the war and the, and the memory of the war, and it has the traces of bef- before the war with its archives. If all these do not matter and we cannot save this building, you expect me to save a triple arch ar- a house in Jamaica? <laughs> how, ex- how can I lose this fight? Yeah. It cannot be lost. It cannot be lost. Yeah. So I have the feeling the same feeling today about Delhi. I tell them, if we, if we cannot, if we lose Sorry, the Delhi, what is, what you... the Delhi of Rauche, the, oh, the, the yes, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, For yeah. me, it's also, it has the archaeological yeah. importance, the architect, the geological importance, the, the location importance, the prominence of uh, the social, you know, memory. So some fights, you have to win. If you lose them, then the city is lost, you know? For me, it was like a, li- a, a life or death thing. And you stood up, to everyone I felt that I was you know I was a young architect who knew yeah. no, I didn't have the I didn't know the people I know today although I'm a very social person but at that time I was two years out of the university sure, sure. four years out of university yeah. one of them is in, in Italy so for me I knew I'm a sociable person but I knew normal people I didn't know ministers and, and municipality councils uh, council members and stuff that day we went and sat I took the office with me ah, that was nine, but that took three years right 1994 till 1997 was the discovery part was the yeah. fun part, part I was taking people to look but it's interesting a quarter of a century later yeah. and not much has changed because no. you back then were sending the right signal which is i shouldn't be doing this you should be doing this why am i standing up to a bulldozer why am i screaming and shouting when no one's listening and then you fast forward a quarter of a century we lost a lot of those types of buildings that is a stunningly beautiful building but the other ones that were that should have been saved were Erased. And we never talk about buildings. We should talk about clusters. We should yeah. talk about how many buildings together make make yeah. the city a, a place to rem- to remember the the way the city really you know, developed. It's Fifteen years of a civil war that caused damage, and then it's about twenty nine years of post civil war that caused much, much more, more damage, damage to the city. So we're talking about almost half a century now of erase of erasing, and making this making Beirut an uglier place. It, it just lost a lot of its charm. But you, you're standing there, and you're also, I don't know if you're deliberately doing this and aware of what you're doing, you're creating something post-war that should have been replicated throughout Lebanon. You're now fighting to keep a place open that we can all reflect. For me, it was, it was one but it was a very important one. Yeah. And I never wanted it to be one. I wanted it to be something that people like. And when, when this was saved, it, it really 
snowball to other to yeah. others because yeah. it was a, a fight that was really desperate and people would say just forget about it it will not work so from 1997 when they started demolishing the building because it was uh, it was uh, destined to become another building site until 2003 when the decree came out and yet when the decree of expropriation for a museum came out they told me they will not expropriate and they really didn't expropriate until another five years so 2008 the expropriation happened and we were only two years away from losing the expropriation and then if so that, that's a decade of literally very like tense situation literally yeah. 2000 and from 1997 to 2008 yeah. until the expropriation really happened yes. and then was the fight to 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 restore to have a project of restoration that wouldn't be uh, polishing the building and erasing the, the war memory and that was a feat by itself because it was the first attempt for a governmental building it's a municipality-owned building that kept the war traces. There's not one single other one in Beirut. Yeah. The others are private, right? Uh, or or they're, not, they're or accidental they're relics, stuff. like yeah. the Holiday like Inn. the Holiday yeah, Inn, or, or the Mud. Egg, yeah. or the Moor, but yeah. they are private. Right. This is the municipality of Beirut yes. who is restoring a building with the bullet holes. Yes, yes. So this is what's even more... It's a miracle that this happened because... Yeah. And they wanted to remove as much as possible. So why don't we keep the first floor and remove the bunker on the ground floor? No, we keep everything. Now I have. I am very critical of the res of the rehabilitation. I think the architect Yusuf Haider has damaged the building beyond beyond redemption, because he has. Um, his intervention is very omnipresent. It's very. He hasn't. Um, let's say acknowledged the importance of the building both architecturally and the importance of the traces so removing were, were you intimately involved with him in that decision making not at all I was not allowed you were not allowed he to would, he wouldn't even he, he, can you imagine that an architect who was who was given the responsibility to restore this building didn't once interview me didn't once talk to me once he, yes. he, he, I, mean, I forced were myself you, were you on the put, building. Were you put away? Aside. Like, yeah, yeah. So you, okay. So but you, yet, mm. I formed my own scientific committee uh -huh, uh -huh. of 18 people from, from all, uh, you know, architects, urban planners, civil society activists, uh, archive specialists, uh, museum specialists. So we had, we had the Arab Image Foundation, OMAM, um, uh, all, the, all the architects and urban planners who were involved with the heritage preservation activities of, of Beirut. Um, and those were the people whom we formed a consulting committee to the municipality of Beirut who, who had an architect that wouldn't talk to us. So we would, sell, we would send our reports to the municipality, the municipality would send to him, he would reply with, I have a contract, they don't. And that was, that was a fight over the four years of his In, in of your, his in your opinion, is it, is it just petty personal problem or is it something bigger than that, that no it's really it's mega it's the ego ego of an architect this is really an issue because it's a public it's a public building yeah. you know this building first should that should, should have had more participatory uh, approach in its if it really wanted to play its role mm. the even in the rehabilitation should have been more participatory but the the, the mistakes are fatal one what the first one is removing one part of the building which was the service staircase which was in the yes. garden which yeah. actually is why the building looks what is what it what it looks like because it was why the Yusuf F was the first architect gave a chance to for Al Qazah the second architect to continue the building is the municipality fully aware that the most I mean it's a breathtaking municipality right for, it's a beautiful facade it's the same architect that is why why for me it was also <laughs> Yusuf why, Timos did exactly. the municipality and it's the municipality that, that wants to destroy what he built exactly. in Beirut I mean and this is like a double crime hundred years later and we can talk today of another crime which is restoring Asim Salam's uh, Ministry of Tourism glass pavilion which is an icon of modern architecture by adding a triple arch uh, to, the, to its facade so these are like I mean we do not have the know-how we have ignorance uh, be it in all good intention right now we are they are very happy it's a very clean and beautiful usable space yeah. but it has destroyed its architectural avant-garde memory and it's it's you know it's value so i want to get into a more delicate issue which is something you said at the beginning beirut lebanon is full of brilliant architects brilliant urban planners i mean some of the most 
astute engineers in this part of the world and the world. And the world. And the municipality is on a... And the urban planning department. And and the the director general of urban planning. Yeah. And the director general of antiquities. We don't use. We don't. We don't want to use our knowledge. We can I ask you? Give wh- them. Where? Do, I mean, since you've been involved with this most of your life now, and most of your professional life is in that sort of balance. What is the stumbling block for getting that kind of talent on board? And and when it comes to governance, if you are if you are really non-compromising, yeah. you wouldn't let things happen mm-hmm. the wrong way, right? Mm-hmm. What do you do when a politician has an invested vested interest in doing something the wrong way? Yeah. Why, what do you do when somebody wants to build a resort in the public maritime domain on, on Ram Little Baida called the Eden Bay? How do you, how would you get to be in a position, in a decisive position, when you would hinder all the wrong things which will get, make, peop- make people in power make more money? There's no clear way to change how the municipality or how residents either respect or appreciate or hold on to their lost heritage. Yeah, but take it to other uh, more mundane issues. I mean, why would a municipality insist to bring an incinerator when, when, (laughs) when all the all the environmental uh, uh, professional uh, professionals and professors and researchers, and and uh, activists are have proven for for real that this is a failing uh, an environmentally toxic project yeah. in the city of Beirut partic- and it doesn't fit the type of waste why why because it's a it's there's somebody making money out of this project so if you know what you're saying you don't have a place in this government if you know what you're saying i'm i'm sorry but it's 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 failing on all levels on the urban level on the environmental level we're destroying our city not only physically we're destroying environment it environmentally and socially and economically preservation should be cost free this should not be a money related issue and it does not need to, there's multiple ways of giving back and owners share or there's many ways of of dealing with the money problem rather than cutting corners and trying to make short-term profit. And I, I, I've seen Beirut disappear. Yeah, and because I, I, we don't have a law, Ronnie. Yeah, There's no preservation law. The law that we work with is the, a, a French mandate law, okay, that preserves what is older than 1700. Everything beyond 17, 19, 1700 is considered something that wait, either the... You, you, 1700? Yeah, that's what is archaeology. Bu- oh. What's, be, what's built before 1700 is protected by this law. That's the only law that's currently applicable but in even Lebanon. Even that's not well protected. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, even, of course, yeah, it's the, the, the looting is <laughs> right, left, and yeah, center. But yeah. that is protected by law. So that is illegal if you do something. But, but after that, either the, the government expropriates or the government lists on the list of protected buildings, not protected buildings, it's called the Ahl al And... Oh, okay. Otherwise, yeah. there's no law to protect any kind of any kind of architectural preservation. So three hundred years is totally, totally just uh, you know whatever illegal. you. There's no legal way to protect them. It's, it's horrible governance and corruption, and that's it. Yeah, but it's, when it's, we when we wanted to, when we told yeah. the, the municipality, why don't we make yeah. you know public hearings yeah. to tell people what's happening to this museum that they've been hearing about for years? The they pub- said if they come. And they do not like it. They will. They will slow the project. So the people are, to them, are interference. So it's the public order has disengaged from the public. Hundred percent. Do you think a hundred years ago, ninety, eighty years ago, that Beirut's municipality was very, was invested in, the public's needs, or is that I, really just an? Yeah, is, is this an so accident of history, that we were under French rule for two decades? And before that, we were under Ottoman rule, and a lot of what we really love about the city was yeah. from those years. From those years. Yeah. Is that, I mean, because it can't be that dramatic Change. from, yeah, yeah, even with a war. I do agree that we have always been an individualistic society. Mm. I do say, never, I always say, don't think it's the war. It's yeah. before the war. And it is, everything we're doing is really, you know, against every public interest. Because I will quote a friend. He once told me Lebanon is not a country, it's a country club. And 
if you really Who, who's your friend I like that uh, quote a lot he's, he, he quoted a f- another f- a friend of his <laughs> so he never told he, he asked me never uh, that, this, to say it, it's a quotation but it's not mine <laughs> that's all but when I think about it's it it's a good quote you know it's, we do not have the collective we have the, we are members in a country club right so we, we we have to be served but we don't do anything so we leave our we leave our towel we leave our crocs we leave we don't we leave our cigarette butts and because nobody taught us that it's our responsibility to give back because they never gave us. And to be fair, to be fair, it shouldn't be our responsibility. It should be something else that is neutral and technocratic. A municipality should be able to do these things. And if they're doing it the wrong way, they're voted out, someone else is brought in. And that's kind of the way it would function and it should function. Instead, we have a degradation. And for Edge Heb, I mean, six years is not long enough. Yeah. That's, uh, it's, and I mean. That's he, all we got. That's all we got. And I mean, I, I always think back that he didn't have any children, and that was, I think he was proud of that. He, won't, he wouldn't sort of do what other people do here, which is their children inherit the throne. You know, one of the, <laughs> one of the funniest things about the Barakat building archive was from Najib Shimali is when I found on his attic this pile of newspapers that mm. he collected, mm. and there was a big folder, and it had new old newspapers, but it 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 was a collection that he done he yeah. done, and everything every every uh, title you see you just remove this the 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 name. You know the 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 first name, and leave the family name, and you would say the thing. So you remove Pierre, uh-huh, and you uh-huh. put Sammy, who yes. was the grandson, yes, yes, and he yes. would be saying exactly the same thing right. today. Kamal, you remove Kamal, and Walid. you put Walid yeah. or Taimur, right. and you'd be right. exactly the same. Yeah. It was so funny because, and I I do I put this. So it was the parliamentary elections in yes. 2001, and when you saw when I I showed the parallels, it was really almost scary that nothing has changed even in the political outlook of these people. It seems only natural that Muna's career would eventually reach politics. And what drove her to help save the Bereket building and what she found scattered throughout downtown and even in the Bereket building, these photos, these memories of pre-war Lebanon, I think it's always in the back of her mind that Beirut lost a sense of its public domain, its communal space. And she entered politics by joining a local team, Beirut Medinity, and they ran for municipal elections in 2016. Now, they ultimately lost, but they did manage to raise awareness for at least the bare minimum when it comes to zoning, planning, green space, sidewalks, simple things that should be shielded from regional problems and from geopolitics and from sectarianism. Now, similar to the political names Muna found in the Barakat building that are still with us today, it seems like the power-sharing structure of Lebanon prevents someone like Muna to properly take part in policy. I'm passionate of anything that has a collective public side to it. most interested in Martyrs Square when it comes to not just its history, its architecture, but its photos. Because the photos say the story. And I depend on photos when I give the tour, and I, when I explain Martyrs Square. There's just no other way. And those photos are, I mean... And you see through, You right? see through it, exactly. Were you thinking back to your parents' and grandparents' photos when you were doing this? Was that... So 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 much because you know when you see some these photos, mm. irre- irre- irrespective of where, where you come from or from which uh, which social status or whatever yeah. or or area or sect, you would identify with these photos because you've had them in your family albums. Yes. you've seen it in on your grandma's you know yes. uh, de- uh, table in the middle of the salon. You've seen something that looked like yeah. it. Yeah. You know, black and white, forty five years old, different hairstyles, uh, people who look you and. The way the people look you in the eyes, because they were negatives, so the eyes were white. Yeah. And whenever I put them against the light, these people look back at me. And it was, it was sometimes I was like, these people are asking me to identify them. They're they're really looking back at me. And those were you know, you know, there were thousands of those, of those you know, portraits, 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 family portraits, portraits, portraits. It was, there is not one single uh, nature scene or outdoor scene. It's just studio portraits. Really, so it's just individuals and their expressions. Individu- 
boys girls uh, young young chaps uh, uh, old old people and and families and the families would be muslims and christians because yeah. you know the muslims really there's you know some of them are veiled the veiled are the muslims the christians are the ones with the with the with the yeah. candles if they are going to the uh, palm sunday so it's really like it's the city it's the city and it's the city in this span of time in that little mezzanine that the art artist the, the photographer took all those photos in so it really reflects definitely the city in nine in the 1970s in the 1970s and do you always have that in the back of your mind today that that it's the just before the civil war is that your is that a um a, a consistency in how you see beirut and because how you work this is in the beirut that we still we still connect to yeah like for me i, I could go all the way all the way to the 1920s right. because beirut that we see today has still connections all the way to the ottoman time mm -hmm. but that part is the part that my parents lived Isn't right? it curious that, I hear about. that you never lived through that i i mean yeah so we're, we're you're working to hold on to something you've never seen Because, I think that's also yeah. it's it's quite I mean it's romantic. It is. I'm definitely a romantic romantic person. I always think that, but I always think that it will make us move forward in a better way, because it would make us connect to the collectivity that we've lost. Yeah. What I'm interested about is a collectivity that we definitely have lost, and maybe that would be, even if it didn't have a collect maybe those people also didn't have a collective identity but they became our collective identity yeah. and you're also working to heal the civil war because i think that's 100% because yeah. i lived it and yeah. i survived it and i never ever took that for granted yeah. i always think that i survived the war yeah because people maybe have moved on and i always think that i survived the war do you know what that means during those 15 years 100,000 didn't and I did yeah. and I think that many people dismiss this as you know of course everybody knows that war has a stamp stamps your life but I never took it for granted because yeah. I really was looked at my mother's eyes so many times and I said goodbye to her in my deepest deepest you know thoughts because I thought we're not surviving this and we did and another time and another time I think that's the resilience that really made Lebanon a, this resilient place yeah. but that same resilience is what made us individualistic, we want to survive we want to move on, we don't care if the other doesn't but we want to move on, so I think that's the double edged sword that we are so you know resilient and want to survive but we survive on our own. And we survive in the short term rather than the long term 100%. I mean every property dispute every development everything is designed in a almost like immediate there's not more than a year thought yeah. through I want to make money now yes I, I can see it now even when that value will diminish over time it doesn't matter now there's short term profit long term who cares Unfortunately. and that includes trash mountain and British Hamoud next to the airport that includes the toxins filling the city today the disappearing mountains I mean that's our generation we've watched We've watched nature disappear too. Yeah. Exactly, and that's very important. And that's a very important part that people will will come to realize very soon. I if, think so if, too. Because yeah. now this, the activists are realizing it, but yeah. the people haven't really come to terms with it. I think we're uh, we're beginning to, I think, finally wake up to that. That this is this is going. You know what, Ronnie? I'm very very sad and very not very optimistic because. When I saw the garbage in the streets of Beirut, when I had to wear a mask with my son to walk in the in Verdun Street, it's not not like in you know a, p a part of Basta, which is not very important. You're speaking about seven years, eight years, um, yeah, 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 recent. I'm speaking yeah, yeah. of 2015, yeah, yeah, five, four years ago. Yeah, yeah. When when really the garbage lined the most every part of the street, this, yeah. the 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 poor and the, and the and the rich, I thought that the city will wake up. And the people will wake up, and this will be a non, a no. How do you say, um, the one way forward? Right. People will not stop until they really get their rights, until they really think that they are going to have a better life for their children. But unfortunately, this gave, of course, a big impetus. And Beirut Medinati, which I ran for, was based on that, on that anger that yeah. people really felt and that dissatisfaction and the, felt, the feeling that we do not count in the, in the, in the politicians' eyes. Yeah. The public interest is not existing. I thought that would be in a point of no return. Right. I, I do not see it today because people, once they shoved the, 
the uh, garbage under the mountains and they took them to, you know, they just right, left, and they, they came out with stupid solutions that are not, you know, short term and actually more, more destructive because that, at least you see it in the street, the others you're not seeing it, but it's polluting everything else. I, f I, I felt that even that, even that shock didn't make the people because they also want to live and they want to make their money to, because people are dying because they're not making enough money i understand the priorities but i do not understand why we didn't stay in this on the streets until everything started to work i think aside from urban planners engineers architects doctors any profession you name it i think lebanon has also among the most sophisticated civil society people we and, are doing everything right yeah and and they are as disadvantaged as anyone else so it's you true. have a flourishing civil society that wants even running for elections running for the municipality and even then it's it doesn't work and i don't think it's not just petty politics i think it is a much it's a structural problem here that it, there's no trash crisis that the city is really self-destructing, and even that doesn't take people away. Maybe now because you can't breathe. Maybe now, I mean, it. it what it would it take to make these people realize that these politicians are corrupt? You know, I think probably Beirut would depopulate before it'll, you know, uh, have good governance. <laughs> I mean, we're working. Beirut Madinati is yeah. still working. It, yeah. it is a slow process. I agree that. I would never never say that it's a, in, in two or three years you would have that change. Yeah. But but still, I feel that it should be much more. People should be, when we do a, a, a protest against the incinerators, I feel there should be 2,000 people. We, ha we ha get 20 people, 200 people. I'm want, I want to ask a broader question. Do you think these issues, which are domestic, these are not regional problems. Yeah. Beirut's trash is a city issue. It's not even a Lebanese issue. It's a city yeah. issue. Uh, or even clean water or a corniche that's access not... Access to the beach. Access to the beach. Preserving the view. Yeah. These are domestic issues. It has nothing to do with Iran or Saudi Arabia. This is unrelated. But do you think the regional problems, because they tend to impact Lebanon in unusual ways and in very detrimental ways. Do you think there's an erosion in, the, in these issues as well? Does it penetrate these issues, in your opinion? Be Medina to Beirut is a domestic movement caring about really like Municipality, sidewalks, yeah. I mean, trash, daily, water, daily making stuff. Making the city a more livable place. Right. Do you think the region's problems trickle down into these issues too where suddenly people are looking at issues that are unrelated to Medina to Beirut they're looking at I lose my sectarian influence here it's all political it's all political and not necessarily domestic it could be definitely yeah. definitely not because it's, you have to really look at the you know Lebanon is such a small country yeah. everything is intertwined I mean sure. you can't you can't lose the municipal elections to, to a bunch of activists and then claim that you are politically you know strong and then you can deal right. with your I mean it's I think Beirut Medinity has shaken the political system mm -hmm. because just having getting 40% of the votes by this us bunch of activists or bunch of, of civil society professionals was really something that wasn't expected, so right? So to you that is a ground up thing where you're looking deliberately away from the regional problems and saying, give us this space to operate because the region's problems are so big and... We can't and, influence and them, right? Decades and centuries that... Not me, not my son, maybe my grandson, I don't know. Right, so yeah, you're I saying... I want me and my son to live in... to have the simplest rights yeah. that, that we can do. And you're asking for a very small operating space. You're not asking for changing the confessional power structure of Lebanon. You're but asking Ronnie, for... But, because yeah. I, I... through Beirut Medinati, I found out... Pers now now, now mm -hmm. it's personally, mm -hmm. personally, Muna. When I found that even that is is difficult, yeah. or it's now we're working for the 2022 elections, but waiting for that, I'm not losing another six years. So I decided to do what I do best, which is 
tactical urban interventions. I want to do what I can do alone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? So I can put a small open public library on Jean d'Arc by yeah. fundraising for it, designing yeah. it, uh, taking a municipality permit and putting it. I can beautify a mural uh, with the children of the city on a, on a wall. I can bring back the sound of the sea by putting a horn and live transmission from the yes. port of the fishermen on to enliven, re-enliven a public staircase that has been left out. So you're replicating so, your achievement in Barakat building on in, a small on a scale, small scale that is doable and that wouldn't take for 24 years of my life, right? Absolutely. And now we're getting into what I consider my favorite part of the city because Martyr's Square cannot be that today. I, I am nostalgic of Martyr's Square. I'm not very fond of its current state, but I consider Ras Beirut home. I'm guessing you do too. That's right. You are intervening heavily in Ras Beirut. And you are, yeah, and I think you've done, like you said, these are minor but important accomplishments. And you are replicating Barakat building on a small scale. What I'm trying through the AUB Neighborhood Initiative, which tries to connect AUB to the neighborhood and to make AUB uh, give back to the neighborhood mm -hmm. and at the same time use the neighborhood as a, as a pilot, mm -hmm. right? So in Ras Beirut, all the problems that exist in the city, in the other cities or in Beirut yeah. exist, right? So walkability, trash, uh, waste management, yeah. uh, uh, traffic, uh, pollution, they are all there, right? Yeah. So if if I can use the the resources that AUB has as both both the human and and uh, otherwise and uh, try to present solutions to the city mm. and pilot them in Ras Beirut and then tell the municipality yes you can do a pedestrian friendly street right. Jean d'Arc is a pedestrian friendly yeah. design implement it take it and do it elsewhere this is the way you should park instead of putting these uh, uh, concrete blocks to block uh, cars from parking in some places yeah. put things that uh, bicycles can uh, structures that bicycles can be tied to and so they're now the visible parking. they're visible in yeah. Jean d'Arc they're visible so, in so yeah. just just see the city in a different way I cannot say do not block put those concrete blocks because they will put them I'm saying remove them and make them something usable for the city I cannot tell them do not redo uh, the projects of you know renovating the streets, but instead of renovating by, by just changing the tiling, think a little bit forward and say, if we delete one parking lane and give it back to the sidewalk, it would become a better sidewalk and a more pedestrian friendly. So just do take that little step forward yeah. that would not take a, a presidential decree and we have to wait for the government and for the, for the parliament to convene to... We have worked on the pre heritage preservation law of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I have started in 1995. Yes. It's been I have worked for 24 years, so I'm the I'm the young person. <laughs> People have died. Amin Bizri died. He is the one who first presented. We have presented it 2007 to the to the parliament with Tariq Mitri. It was to the government. It was approved. Went to the parliament. Slept there. 2017 revived with Ronia Raji. Approved by the cabinet. Went to the parliament. It slept there. I'm not ready for more 24 year. <laughs> <laughs> I want the these thing long, that I can long, do. Long naps. Yeah, I yeah. really just want to do things. So, and I think that's very well appreciated by the people. They can see the change. They can see this is a better, even in that micro level, it's yeah. a better place. It's a more inclusive city. When we do the farmer's market now on John Dark Street and people come and sit together and they don't have to buy, they just can sit. I just put these benches and these tables and they just can sit in that lot. And whether they buy or not, they get their children, they get their dogs, they get their cats. And then suddenly there's this public space that we have introduced to a place where it has no public space. Yeah. And there's no, pl no way that the municipality is going to expropriate a land and make it a public space. Yeah. Right. They, 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 we have a yeah. three, four gardens, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. So we are creating public space on the sidewalk by making it wider. We are creating public space by taking a parking lot and having a suspended garden in it. You know, these are the issue. The pl we have to be creative to give the public space back to the public in a creative way. It seems more and more like as yourself as an architect and activist, and I think you probably consider yourself both at the same degree, that you're taking a step back from both and you're focusing on people more than, more than the city. You're focusing on its residents now. And is that a deliberate attempt for you to wake people up and saying, if I'm not going to succeed at the governance level 
if I'm limited to just a few buildings here and there, maybe one building, that it's now my role to work with people and wake them up deliberately so that maybe generations from now they'll eventually appreciate it? That's definitely exactly what I came... I, I think that now, after, after 25 years of activism, what I found out is that the change... Of course, the change is the people, mm. but I was trying to save the things for the people, right? Yes. Like, yes. to keep the things that the people would appreciate. Yeah. But since it's not happening... I think that com really we should just work on making people and specifically children yeah. appreciate what they have. Just creating anywhere where people feel that they are a community, irrespective of race, sect, um, uh, nationality, it's, it's only human. And I really take it at heart that in the next 10 years of my life, this is what I want to do. I want to be proud that I brought some people together and I brought people closer to their city. You've definitely done that. And I think you should be proud. And I, I'm sure people do, aside from these people that approach you on the street, I think uh, the city owes a lot to you. And before we wrap up, if you were mayor, do you think you could actually do any of the above that you mentioned? I decided in the two years after Beirut Medinati that I would not, I would not run for that again. If you were appointed mayor, do you think you would be able to do any of what you've just mentioned? The political pressures are so huge. I would definitely not compromise. I don't think I will stay. Uh, even if I win, I will not be kept there for, for long. So even a good and well-intentioned mayor cannot affect change. It is a very, very difficult, yeah. difficult. Uh, you have to have the municipal council you have to win maybe that's the good thing about a majoritarian uh, that you come either you come as 24 and a mayor yeah or it's better not to be there because it's so frustrating 24 and a mayor would you be able to do what yes. you're talking about yes. yeah because you have a control over the budget but you don't have the stomach for that again uh, i'm i'm too i think i'm too tired you're too of, tired i'm yeah. too tired of of having to waste you know, the time that I've put in my life trying yeah. to stop the yeah. damage is more than the time that was productive. Yes. I just want to be productive. It's still a dream, and I think it's a far-fetched dream on the on the ma macro level. Yeah. That's why I'm I'm going to fulfill my dreams on a micro level. We follow this dream together. I hope your kids and my kids, your grandsons and my granddaughters will go to Beit Beirut and to be a Beirut that is a better place. Well, as you said it, Here's to future dreaming. Thank you, Bana. Thank you, Ronnie. The post-Civil War era and all of its facets, political, economic, reconstruction, all of that, it's all tied up with Rafiq Hadidi. And Muna's story is a reflection of those years. And whatever your thoughts are on the man, Rafiq Hadidi put Lebanon back on the world stage. There was another name that is largely forgotten today, and that's Charles Malik, Lebanon's first ambassador to the UN, a diplomat and a philosopher who did put Lebanon on the world stage, albeit in different ways. His role wasn't economic, and it wasn't domestic politics. It was international politics, and I couldn't think of a better person to link Rafiq Hariri's legacy to those early years at the UN than Lebanon's current ambassador to the United Nations, Amal Mdalele. And she's our guest in the next episode, and she'll help explain Lebanon's situation today, and she'll also put Lebanon's relationship to the UN in perspective. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.